crank up the air. My name is Beth Keane. I'm the executive director of the museum, and welcome everyone. Um, we have a really interesting um, event today, and um, we're thrilled that all of you can be here today with us. I am going to hand it over to our board president, Paul Newsbaum. And please stick around because even after Barbara's lecture, we will have a Q&A. Thank you. That was our great executive director, Beth Keene. Um, my name is Paul Nussbaum. I have the honor of being the president of the museum. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here today, the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Uh, we have a full room. Um, we have a, some great partners uh, that helped us put this program on today. Um, the American Jewish Committee, uh, Gosha Weiss, where are you? Oh, you're right there. Um, she's the uh, senior associate for for Polish Jewish affairs. Um, also, the Polish Council, is this too loud? Okay. Uh, the Polish Consulate General of the Republic of Poland uh, and the Vice Council, uh, I guess, where are they? Yeah. They are, they are partners in this. Uh, Jaroslaw Lezinski is the Council General, uh, and Ignacy Zarski is the Vice Council for Culture, Press, and uh, Community. We're, we're also partnering with the UCLA Levy Center and the UCLA Department of World Affairs and, and Culture and with Yiddishkeit. Um, in context of today's program, let me give you just a, a, a little uh, light overview. Um, we all know that Europe has been taking a hard right turn and uh, it's, it's ugly and uh, it, it unfortunately is growing. Uh, you have, you know, the, the Marine Le Pen party, the National Front in France, you have the Golden Door in Greece, you have the uh, Freedom Party in Austria, that is now part of the government uh, of Austria, a coalition partner. Um, you have the, the Orban, Viktor Orban government in Hungary, um, and I was just checking a couple hours ago, today was the parliamentary elections in Hungary, and the government will have a supermajority again, which means that they'll control more than two-thirds of the parliament in Hungary. They've been in power since 2010, and they have been actively dismantling the institutions of democracy there, the press, the judges, uh, the... Uh, just the institutions of government. Um, and this win will allow them to do that uh, much more deeply. Um, today's program is obviously about Poland, and we'll talk about uh, the Polish government and uh, the party that, that leads that government. And I think we're all aware of some of their recent uh, actions that brought around, uh, brought up um, some some reaction from from around the world of democratic countries like our own and and like Israel. Um, it's it's an important concept at this museum um, that we think that history informs us, and it's important to know the history in order to put some of these events that are occurring in Europe in context. Um, we've seen this type of nationalism before, this xenophobia, the actions that create others among us. Unfortunately, we're experiencing that in our own beloved country. And uh, this creation of, of otherness uh, is, a, is a dangerous slope that we hope does not slide to the depths of where it has slid before and we have a um, a very prominent expert to talk to us about what's going on uh, in Poland. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge before I go on. Um, could the survivors in the room please uh, raise their hands and can we recognize them? Um, will docents and volunteers of uh, the museum, would you be so good as to raise your hands? 
We also have a number of members of our board of directors. Would you also raise your hands? I'm not going to ask you to scan because this room is so packed. Thank you. And now, that I mentioned, American Jewish community, uh, for us of our esteemed speaker. And as Beth mentioned, after we hear um, the talk, we're going to have a Q and A. So you know, you can you can think up questions that you want to dive. This will be a deep dive, but if you want to, uh, which I'm sure you will, want to want to dive deeper. Uh, from, from somebody who's on the ground in Poland right now. Um, so here's Gosha Weiss from the American Jewish Community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Gosha Szymańska Weiss. I'm Senior Associate for Polish Jewish Affairs at the American Jewish Community Committee. It's AJC's honor to be able to host Professor Barbara kishenblatt Gimlet in Los Angeles to do this together with the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, very important institution in Los Angeles for the Jewish community and the general community alike. Before I, I have the honor of introducing our esteemed speaker today, I'd like to share with you a few words about why AJC and why Poland. AJC is 112-year-old human relations organization. And we recognized early on that Jews could not be indifferent to Poland. Some of us loved Poland, some of us not so much. But Poland was and is so inextricably tied to our history, memory, and identity that we can't just disregard it, no matter the political context. Soon after the fall of communism, almost 30 years ago, AJC began its engagement with the re-emerging Jewish community and with the country's new leadership. We have been running for more than 20 years together with our Warsaw-based partner Forum for Dialogue, um, an exchange program for AJC leaders uh, and Polish intellectuals and opinion makers. AJC's leadership traveled to Poland regularly, not only to build and nurture relationships, but also help shape the way the new Poland approaches its relationship to the Jewish community and to uh, re remembering and memorializing uh, the Holocaust. In the U.S. Senate, our CEO, David Harris, testified in favor of Poland accession to NATO. He advocated doing so was not only the smart and strategic move, but also the right one and the moral one. We partnered with the Polish government in the design and creation of a moving museum and memorial in Belzec, a death camp near the Ukrainian border where uh, almost half a million people had perished. Finally, exactly a year ago, we opened an office in Warsaw, AGC Central Europe, which represents our organization um, for uh, the, uh, the Poland plus the three remaining Visegrad countries, Hungary, Slovakia, and Czech Republic, and the three Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. At the opening of the office a year ago, a letter from the Polish president, Andrzej Duda, was read to the 500-person audience in the auditorium of the Pauline Museum. Let me quote. I consider it meaningful that this gala takes place in the edifice of the amazing Museum of the History of Polish Jews. This institution is crucially important for preserving the truth about the common history of both our nations. Today, during the crisis caused by the passage of the amendments to the Act on the Institute of National Members, or some call it the Holocaust Discourse Law, AJC knows our presence in Poland is needed more than ever and that these words carry a special meaning. When building relations with our interlocutors, AGC employs sensitivity, understanding, nuance, depth, and sincere recognition that dialogue is a two-way street. <clears throat> and this is precisely how we approach the dialogue with our Polish interlocutors in the wake of the passage of this most unfortunate and harmful legislation. We have been firm in our opposition to the legislation, but also did our best to come to the table as friends with an understanding of the particular sensitivities related to the Polish experience of World War II. We came to the table as friends of Poland, friends who on multiple occasions have strongly advocated against the use of the erroneous and hurtful term Polish concentration camps. Our established relationships, credibility on the issues, and physical presence in Warsaw allowed us to play an important role between the Polish government, the Israeli embassy, and the Jewish community in the wake of the unfolding crisis. 
Our director in Warsaw helped shape the conversation by being present in Polish and American media. She strongly advocated for the toning down of the rhetoric so that the legacy of the 30 years long effort to rebuild <coughs> Polish Jewish relations may withstand. And of course, we continue to stand firm on the position that this harmful law needs to be reversed and that AJC in no way can give consent to limiting the historical debate. The rise of anti-Semitism recently visible in the public sphere in Poland is worrisome, not only for the Jewish community of Poland, but for all people who understand that Polish authorities condemn anti-Semitism and xenophobia, but we hope that they will still demonstrate the political will and undertake specific actions that will stop the demons of anti-Semitism that have awoken. However, we remain hopeful that both the government and the civil society will be committed to finding a solution to this current situation. Just like in the past decades and in the last year today, we continue to be a friend of Poland. Poland, which has the potential to be a leader within the EU, a critical ally to the US, friendly partner to Israel, a free and democratic country in which the Jewish community feels safe and welcome. Poland, who has many reasons to be proud, one of them being the ability and readiness to con conduct a constructive, open dialogue in which AGC is ready to participate. With that, let me introduce our distinguished speaker this afternoon. Professor Barbara kirschenblatt Firmet is the chief curator of the core exhibition at Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, Poland, and advisor to the museum's director. She's university professor emerita and professor emerita of performance studies at New York University. She received honorary doctorates from the Jewish Theological Seminary and University of Haifa, she was decorated with the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland for her contribution to Polish Museum. Most recently, she was elected to the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and will receive an honorary doctorate from Indiana University in May 2018. I know. I need, I need a box. Just like, uh, you know, like, like Dr. Ruth. Yeah. Only a little taller. So first, first of all, I just want to say how absolutely delighted I am to be here. I want to thank the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust for hosting us. And I want to thank our co-sponsors, but particularly the uh, American Jewish Committee and especially uh, both um, Gosha and Beth, who have really gone out of their way to organize this event. But I'm especially happy that Yiddishkeit is one of our co-sponsors, that two departments, two centers at UCLA are among our co-sponsors as well. But, I, but maybe, maybe most of all, I see so many familiar faces of friends and colleagues that I have known for more than 20 years that are here in the room, and it feels like a reunion. So I really am very touched, and uh, it's very, very special for me. So, what's going on with Poland? Well, I hope that something will go on with this. Just a moment. Where is our tech guy? Uh, let's see. Why is it not moving? Okay. Yeah. 
So, okay, while we're trying to get the technology working, uh, we say in Yiddish, before I begin to speak, I'd like to say a few words. <laughs> so, I'm going to use this opportunity to say a few words. So, I want to tell you a little bit about my connection to this topic. Polish Jews, and they came to Canada. World War II. And the incredible opportunity to serve as chief curator of the core exhibition at Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And to do that, I actually moved to Poland and lived there for 10 years full time and became a Polish citizen. And so I would, I, what I want to really do by way of introduction is to say that this country means a lot to me. I care deeply about it. I am very aware of its complicated and difficult history, very, very aware of it. And at the same time, I actually, knowing how difficult the current situation is, um, I hold out a certain kind of optimism that it won't be like this forever. It wasn't like this two years ago, and hopefully two years from now, we don't know what will happen in terms of the elections, but I do, I do feel that this is a very, very important place. It's not only the epicenter of the genocide, it's not only where the Germans built death camps in occupied Poland, but it's also a place where Jews lived for a millennium, where they became the largest Jewish community in the world, where they created an incredible civilization, the legacy of which we live with to this day. And so it's really in that context that I want to really talk to you about what's going on in Poland now and I want to do so from the perspective of my own experience, which is particularly in relationship to museums and the cultural sector, because it's not only uh, a matter of politics, it's not only a matter of this so-called Holocaust bill, and, and I'm going to try to touch on some other aspects, it's also the, the actual repercussions in terms of uh, cultural institutions and the uh, academic institutions, scholarship, um, and the way in which history is being deployed. So it's, it's those aspects that I really want to focus on, and I am so hoping that we're going to be able to actually show you. Uh, how many, how, how's it working? <laughs> it's not going well. It's not going well, but is it working from here? This one? Yeah, it is. Okay. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. 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 Oh, my God. Maybe it will, maybe it will work. Holy cow, this might just work. So, you know, uh, well, and I'll try, I'll try, sort of try and manage all of these <laughs> factors together. Okay, 2018 is a banner year. 2018 is the 100th anniversary of Poland's regained independence. That means that after between 120 and 140 years, where the great Polish Dominion Commonwealth was partitioned uh, between Russia, Prussia, and Austria, after that long period, Finally, 2018 was the establishment of the Second Polish Republic. And during the 1920s and 1930s, this was really an extraordinary period because despite economic hardship and despite rising anti-Semitism, it was a kind of, I would say, a kind of golden age uh, in terms of political Jewish political engagement and Jewish cultural creativity. But I want to say something else about this period, and that is that the interwar years was a period when Poland is one of the most diverse countries in Europe. Up to 40% of the population was not Catholic, and more than 30% was not ethnically Polish. The largest minority was Ukrainians, and then Jews who were, who were about 10% of the population, and then others, Czechs, uh, Germans, Belarusians, Lithuanians. And so the period of the interwar years is a period of incredible diversity of what were called national minorities, whose cultural rights were at least theoretically protected by clauses that had been appended to the Treaty of Versailles, to the Peace Treaty. So that, that, that is really a critical, uh, I, I think, a critical point. Plus, Poland was holding the largest Jewish community in Europe. It was 3 million, approximately 3 million, 300,000 Jews, which is actually, uh, I would say, one of the key reasons why the Germans decided to create the death camps in, in Poland, which is where that half the, half the Jewish population of Europe was living. 
And I say that because this is an anniversary that is being commemorated in a very different Poland. That is, as a result of genocide, of the redrawing of borders, of the relocation of population, of assimilation, of communism, of emigration, Poland is today one of the most homogeneous countries in Europe, less than 4% of the country is not ethnically Polish, and it is also home to one, Poland, which had been home to one of the largest Jewish communities in Europe, is today home to one of the smallest. And so you have to be thinking in terms of the pre-war situation and the post-war situation to understand something about how 2018, the 100th anniversary of Poland's regained independence, can be understood, understood and celebrated. The second big anniversary is the 75th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And that's much less, if you will, much less a point of controversy. Um, and it is around what we call a round anniversary. And as we get to the 75th, the 80th, we get to a time when there'll be no living survivors. And so there's a sense of urgency, a sense of the moment that this is a terribly important um, anniversary. And then thirdly, and this has become very contentious, it's the 50th anniversary of March 68. Now, in, in, and I'll talk more about it, but just very briefly, uh, during uh, March 68, is the, it was a moment when the communist government m mounted a state-sponsored propaganda campaign that was technically anti-Zionist, but turned out to be truly anti-Semitic. And as a result, more than half the Jews living in Poland at the time, there were approximately 20,000 Jews living in Poland, and about 13,000 of them were released, uh, released, were fired, harassed, and left. And they left on one-way travel documents, they had to give up their Polish citizenship, and it was the most humiliating, traumatic experience. And those who were felt, for, that, that, felt that they were forced to leave have never forgotten it. And so the, the 50th anniversary from the perspective of Pauline Museum is a, uh, an opportunity to commemorate the events of March 68. And, there, and I'll try to suggest to you the controversies that are arising around it because they are related to um, the, the current situation. So let me start with the 100th anniversary. Uh, just a moment, I have to go down one. I'm hoping that it will come up on the screen. Just a moment. Uh, there we are. Okay. So one of the things I've done in, uh, for our presentation today is to try to give you a sense of how the media is dealing with these events. So many, many of my um, uh, slides are actually taken from the media, taken from official government media, from Polish radio, from the president's uh, website. And so it gives you a sense of, um, if you will, public awareness and public concerns. So let's start with, uh, the, with President Duda's comment about how 2018 should be remembered. It should be a year of national pride. And he said, and this was in his New, in New Year's Eve address, he said that 2017 has been a year of major changes in the country, and he urged compatriots to make 2000 year our year of national pride. And national pride is at the very heart of the historical policy of the current uh, government, of the, of the uh, law and justice government. National pride, it's an absolute key. And in fact, when Duda was running for, what campaigning for president, he actually took to task uh, his competition by speaking of what he called ped the pedagogy of shame. Down with the pedagogy of shame, we must lift ourselves up from our knees, we must encourage national pride, uh, we must uh, encourage uh, uh, patriotism, so if this goes very much, I think, also to Paul's introductory comments about nationalism. Although, although, as I'll talk about in just a moment, um, Kaczynski and others, that is to say the leader of this, um, uh, the Law and Justice Party and others, have made a distinction between patriotism and nationalism. But we can, we can maybe come back to that in just a moment. And so it's in this context, it's in this context of national pride and with the, it, it is in the context of feeling that until the current government came into power, that the previous center-right government had engaged in what they called a pedagogy of shame, which meant uh, addressing, for example, uh, the pogrom in Yedvavna and, and various others. Uh, it's in this context that there is a concern to protect the reputation of the Republic of Poland and the Polish nation. And this is the rationale 
behind the so-called Holocaust bill. And so here, um, I want you, I, I want us to look at this bill because it, it, from my point of view, it is misguided and it is poorly worded. worded. However, it, and, and maybe for that reason and other reasons, it's also grossly misunderstood. And so the um, polarizing of views on this bill have been, I think, quite um, damaging to any uh, approach to any kind of reasonable dialogue. Currently, currently, the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Tribunal, is reviewing the legality of the bill and have already determined that Poland cannot prosecute, that Poland cannot prosecute foreign citizens, that that's not legal and also not enforceable. So we don't know yet exactly what will come out of it, but let's have a look at it to see what it actually says. What it says is, and whoever claims publicly and contrary to the facts that the Polish nation or the Republic of Poland is responsible or co-responsible for Nazi crimes committed by the Third Reich. That does, in other words, it's not about individuals speaking to their own experience. It's not about survivors talking about what happened to them. It is specifically, specifically the Polish nation have discussion as to and the Republic of Poland. Down in the paragraph, the concern is with whoever otherwise grossly diminishes the responsibility of the two per true perpetrators of said crimes, meaning Germany. And that's the key. Now, it, it, uh, and, and then it continues, uh, point three, no offense is committed. This, this I found really remarkable that any lawmaker, any lawyer could possibly uh, frame a clause in these terms. No offense committed if the criminal act specified in clauses one and two is committed in the course of the of, of sorry of one's artistic or academic activity in other words uh, uh, artists and artists and intellectuals or artists and scholars can commit a criminal act with impunity this is this is clearly this is not a well formulated whatever the intention it is not a well formulated um, law now it, and, and clearly it can't apply to, to to foreign citizens that's that's absolutely obvious but I think what's important here is that this is not Holocaust denial. That's very important. It is not Holocaust denial. And it, uh, I mean, the ambiguity with regard to committed in the course of one's artistic and academic activity, what happens if a scholar, as, as many of them do, are on TV and are in public media and are being interviewed or write for uh, magazines that reach wide, wide distribution? So it's, it's clearly not a well-formulated law, but one has to understand where it's coming from. And the, uh, just one second, okay. And I hope this will come up, there it is, okay. So for, for, for many years, for several years, well before the current government came into power, the issue of Polish death camps was um, a point of enormous sensitivity. Now, it's um, in, in many ways, I think, how can I put it? First of all, it's a problem in English. I, I'm not aware that this is a problem in Polish. And I'm not aware that's, that it's a problem in other European languages. It's actually really a problem in, and, and, and the question is, is it really a problem? Because before this um, attempt to legislate against the phrase Polish death camps, I would say relatively few people were even thinking in those terms. And now everybody does. So, it, it, you know, in, in a sense that this kind of uh, attempt to deal with the, this per perceived problem. The second is, is that um, from my point of view, for the most part, uh, basically, it, it's understood that it's a shorthand. I mean, Jan Karski wrote an article in the 40s during the war, Polish death camps. He also referred in the article to Jewish death camps. And it was clear they were death camps to murder Jews and that they were German death camps on Polish soil. But somehow or other, this phrase has reached a kind of fever pitch of concern. And, oops, oh, God help us. All right. Oh, he did. He did. Oh, my God. All right. So we're back in business. So uh, this is a very hot topic, I can tell you. <laughs> so um, I, I would say this, that the more that, uh, that I think about it and others think about it, 
we have the feeling, that, and I should also add, that legislation isn't the best way to deal with these issues. And that, um, in fact, one of the most effective ways is to get newspapers and TV stations and radio to add to their style sheet. This is not the proper way to, to, to refer to German death camps in occupied Poland. And in fact, New York Times and other media outlets, that's what they've done. And they no longer refer to it. So you don't need a law. You don't need to criminalize speech. You don't need legislation to achieve the objective. But in many ways, it's a rather more domestic issue than it is a, a international issue. That is to say that it is the, the, the issue of Polish complicity or collaboration in the Holocaust that was a German project is so enormously sensitive that this becomes a kind of a shorthand for that much larger, very, very painful topic. And so in many ways, it's playing to, if you will, domestic politics, and I think very much to the supporters of the current, of the current political party. Now, to give you a little bit of a sense, this is a cover from Politica magazine. And what it, I would say the symbolism is fortress Poland. The whole world is against us. It's, it's actually not unlike, I'm, I'm sorry to say, there are a lot of parallels with the United States. So, you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. I think that there are, unfortunately, many parallels with the U.S., but nonetheless, we're talking about Poland today. So, uh, but, but the idea of fortress Poland, meaning the whole world is against us, that the world is anti-Polish, that uh, they speak about us in ways that are historically inaccurate and are insensitive and very, very painful, and that the current, uh, the current government can defend Poland, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, fortify, literally fortify Poland through legislation and through other methods against this, uh, against these attacks on Polish honor and on, uh, if you will, on the good name of Poland. Now, of course, as we all know, this backfired, in, it, it, it's backfired radically, and I don't know how now the country will actually climb out of it. And in the backfiring, Let's see if we can get there. In the backfiring, what we get is from, I would say, an extreme, from the extreme sector, not, not from the moderates, but from the extreme sector. What we get is that, if you will, Jews are responsible for communism, and Germany was responsible for occupying Poland, and that there was a holocaust, that there was a Polish holocaust, and there's even a proposal for a museum of the Polish holocaust. So, and if you know Eastern Europe and post-communist post countries, you know that the word genocide is also being applied in a sense to the two genocides, the red genocide and the brown. And it's a very, very, uh, I think, complicated and difficult situation. Now, what's the result? The result, and this is from the director of Poland Museum, who has been very outspoken and very eloquent on these issues. And what he has said is that this new law um, it has led to, it has made the situation worse, and that it has led to a rise in anti-Semitism and xenophobia, and which is not the intention. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it also contributes much in the way that we see here. It does contribute in strengthening, uh, if you will, the feeling that that only the government in power can solve the problem. And here is um, this is from the Pew Charitable Trust. They did a survey on anti-Semitism in, uh, in Europe, uh, well, actually in Eastern Europe today. And the numbers are really discouraging. Uh, that is to say, overall, about 20% of the population, roughly one in five adults or more, say they would not accept Jews as fellow citizens. And Poland is around 18%, uh, Lithuania 25%, and, uh, and the other countries are falling somewhere in that range or lower. In other words, this bill uh, is a very ill-advised way of achieving the at least stated objectives, which is to defend the good name of Poland. And the, the best way to defend the good name of Poland, at least from the, my perspective and from the perspective of others, is rather to um, uh, turn to not, not criminalize, not legislate, but turn rather to education, to debate, to dialogue, uh, to engagement, um, and that that, more than anything else, would be a way to defend the good name of Poland. So now, how does all of this play out? 
it's, it's not enough to simply say there's this law and they, they don't want anybody to say X, Y, and Z. The way this really plays out is it plays out in what's called a whole historical policy. And that translates as both historical policy and the politics of history. And history is extremely important. It's, it's uh, recent. Um, in fact, it, the history, the post-war history, even the wartime history in Poland feels like it was yesterday. It maybe was today. It feels very immediate. You know, the Civil War here is a long time ago, but World War II is not, and the period under communism is not. And so the immediacy, the feeling of relevance, the feeling that somehow the history has to be seized and the approach to it has to be addressed. And so one of the first things that um, well, and, and so what do we have? We have, and we see it very clearly around the March 68, which I'll say more about in just a moment, but we have a contest of memories and a contest of historical narratives. And, um, and we can see it in a, in a variety of ways. Specifically, um, the, the um, President Duda, November 11, 2015, one of the first things he did was to convene a committee to help him to articulate historical policy. Now, I don't know in the, in the US, I don't know of anything comparable where the government would have an agency or where the president or the, uh, or uh, we don't have a, you know, or any H, for example, would set out historical policy. All the grant applications that came in would have to conform to it. It's just unthinkable in the American context. So what did he say? He said, Poland needs an historical policy. That's, a, a, and of course, it had, presumably has had historical policies, but this one is very particular. And it needs a debate on how to shape civic and patriotic attitudes. That's the purpose of the historical policy. And then he invoked the view of the late President Lech Kaczynski, who said that one must not equate patriotism with nationalism because their roots are entirely different. The foundation of patriotism is love, whereas that of nationalism or xenophobia is hatred. Now, in fact, the patriotism that has been promoted um, and in some ways, the defending of the good name of Poland is part of that. That patriotism has, in fact, unleashed enormous uh, expressions of hate speech and xenophobia. So it, from my point of view, the distinction, it, 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 if you will, the, that is the difference between patriotism and, and xenophobia. It's a distinction without a difference. And that um, when you look on the ground, you, you see that this, this kind of distinction actually it doesn't quite work. Now, what does it actually mean? What it actually means, for example, is the dismantling of, for, for example, the Museum of the Second World War, which was created under the previous government, a center-right government, uh, is actually a marvelous museum. And uh, when the current uh, uh, Law and Justice Party came into power, one of the first things they did was to use a legal maneuver to essentially fire the current director <laughs> and the key people on his staff and to introduce changes. Why? It is a museum of the Second World War, but the argument was that it wasn't patriotic enough, it wasn't Polish enough, it didn't celebrate Polish heroes and martyrs prominently enough, and that it was, uh, and, and its focus, which I thought was uh, very important, was on the, um, the um, cost of war to civilians. So rather than celebrating militarism and celebrating military victory, military heroes, it was much more focused on what war means to civilians. And so the current historical policy criticized it for being too pacifist. It said the problem with the museum is it only shows the bad side of war. And so, you know, when one might ask, well, so what's the good side of war? Well, the good side of war from the perspective of historical policy is to promote patriotism, love of country, willing to sacrifice one's life, uh, um, and also um, a kind of, um, uh, of strength, strengthening. So it's, it's somewhat, I, unfortunately, it's somewhat militaristic. Now, this, this uh, so as a result, a step by step, the new staff of this museum is altering the historical narrative to make it to confer, conform to the official historical policy. Now, it, to give you a feeling of some of the other elements in this historical policy, the Institute of National Remembrance and these other acts um, that among the um, among the things they're supposed to do is they're supposed to prohibit 
of the propagating of communism or other totalitarian systems through the names of buildings, facilities, and areas of public use act. This is a little bit like um, the Confederate flag and the Confederate statues, except that we don't pass laws to deal with them. And here, there's an effort to deal with these issues by legislating and criminalizing. And that's what's really, um, I would say, at the, it's, a, it's a really fundamental, absolutely fundamental issue. But let me show you concretely what it looks like, because I should also say that to understand post-89 Poland, one, one has to understand a kind of division between those who were willing to compromise with figures who would uh, function in the new post-89 government who had a communist past, and those who, according to the Law and Justice Party, felt that there should be no compromise and, and that communism should be rooted out 100%. So what does this look like? This it looks like this. This is where there was a plaque commemorating Rosa Luxemburg. So uh, Rosa Luxemburg was born in Zambosh. She's the single most famous person from the town of Zambosh. Well, I would say the Yudam at Paris. I would put him, you know, I would say from my, from my books, I put him up there too. They didn't take down any plaques to him. I don't know where they are. And incidentally, this plaque was not on her house. It was on another house. It was, I don't even know why they put it where they did. However, uh, very recently, the mayor, in conformity with this law, had it removed. And there was a whole debate about this as to whether it was removed because she's identified with communism, which is also not accurate, or because she was Jewish, which I don't actually think was the issue. I think the issue was some, some, something along these lines. And similarly, um, with, um, event, with the memorial to Yadavna, this is a much earlier image. It's from 2011. But it's consistent with this position of the current government that down with the pedagogy of shame, up from our knees, that we need to focus on the positive aspects of Polish history, on the positive aspects of Polish-Jewish relations, and that, um, that, this, uh, that shame is not, uh, not the way to go. And so uh, I found that, uh, you know, the, so the question is, what's actually going on here? And I found that Daria Stola, our director's comments on this, was for me the most persuasive um, uh, the most persuasive approach to trying to understand where this is coming from, because it's actually a very sympathetic approach. So he says, the high emotions surrounding Polish wartime behavior touch on what some call a Polish, quote, obsession with innocence. And actually, already in the early 90s, Adam Mifnick, in, a, in an interview with Habermas, talked about what he called the triumphalism of innocence in comparison with the German way of dealing with their, uh, with, with, with their guilt. So obsession with an addiction that the nation is morally blameless thanks to its resistance and widespread suffering with millions killed in the war. And in fact, Poland was occupied. There was no collaborationist government. It had an underground state. It had a government in exile. It was absolutely opposed to the Germans and the German occupation was brutal. So uh, the widespread suffering with millions killed in the wars is absolutely accurate. So Stola said that he believes that many cling to this conviction of innocence because it is all they have. Poles lost the war. They lost a lot. Family members, cities, libraries, churches, 20% of their territory and their national independence. Little was left but their innocence. When you lose everything, it's good at least to be innocent. And I think this is a, it's a very sympathetic statement and it's a very profound statement. It does not in any way, uh, I would say, lessen our concern with confronting the dark aspects of the past, but it gives us a little bit more insight. And then he, of course, criticized the current historical policies. And I think his statement here is also very good. Poland was on the correct side of this war and lost it to Hitler and then lost it to Stalin. And then he concludes, we're not responsible for what happened 70 years ago, but we are responsible for what we do with this past today. And I think the right thing to do is to talk about it, not to silence it, and not to criminalize statements about it. So how does this uh, historical policy work? And this is linked to the obsession with innocence. And that is that the Polish righteous have assumed an enormous position of importance. And I would say that 
from the perspective of the current policy, the Polish righteous represent the best of Polish society and um, are estimated, if you will, their numbers from one perspective, they're not, their numbers are exaggerated. That is, however uh, many are acknowledged by Yad Vashem, which is over 6,000, there are others from the, the, the law and justice circles that believe, in fact, there were hundreds of thousands. So um, one of the criticisms of that position is that the numbers are exaggerated. And on the other hand, those who hurt Jews, who robbed, raped, pillaged, and killed, betrayed, blackmailed Jews, are treated as a few bad apples in the barrel, as a few bad actors. In other words, they are underestimated. So that issue of proportion really distinguishes, if you will, historical policy in Poland today from the historical record by reputable historians at Warsaw University and elsewhere. And certainly, uh, so, so that I think is a key issue. So how does this actually work? So uh, just recently, about two years ago, there was the opening of a museum in Markova, a village uh, not far from Belzec in the southeast of Poland. It's actually a really interesting museum. And um, I had an opportunity to visit it. I had an opportunity to meet with the director, Professor Schmidtma. And, uh, and this is a museum that is located in this tiny village in this remote area, because this is where the Ulma family, and you see the Ulma family here on the left, um, Mrs. Ulma is pregnant. They had, uh, they, I think they have six, if I'm not mistaken, six kids. They hid Jews, uh, they, were, they were betrayed, and they and the Jews they hid were murdered. And so, um, and it's a really, they are incredibly noble, and these um, and people like them, Poles like them, are, are, are very exceptional and, are, uh, and deserve every honor uh, that can be accorded to them. And so this museum is really dedicated to them. And, the, and it has now become, there's even on the part of the, the Minister of Culture, the idea of creating a branch of this museum at the UN or in New York um, in an effort to communicate this aspect of the Second World War, especially to Jews living in New York. And of course, we can have a longer conversation as to how that would be received. But, um, but what's important is that this has become, in a sense, the capital, if you will, of the Polish Righteous um, Initiative. And what we should recognize is that after the war, many of these uh, Polish righteous did not want it to be known that they had helped Jews because they were worried about their neighbors. And it was really only once Yad Vashem began to recognize them more, uh, not more prominent, but to be a critical piece of this historical policy. So for example, when the, uh, uh, the, the new um, Prime Minister of Poland held a press conference around the Holocaust bill, he insisted that the conference be held at this museum. So you can see the, if you will, I would call it the instrumentalization or the use of the Polish righteous and of the Ulma family, the Ulma family and Poles who say Jews Museum in, in consistent with, with, with the current historical policy. But we see it also um, at the uh, Pauline Museum. And so one day I come to the museum, and to my astonishment, I see that who's looking at the museum? It's Jan Karski. That, that, that the, the mayor of Warsaw controls the area around the museum. And um, there is this convention of a bench, and Jan Karski sitting on the bench, and people sit on the bench, and they take their photographs, and they leave flowers. And now, on Warsaw in your pocket, the view of Poland Museum is from the back of Jan Karski, a righteous, uh, a righteous Pole, looking at the museum. Or, and that's not, it's certainly not enough, there was a, there's a path that goes all the way from one street to the other in front of the museum, between the museum and the monument to the ghetto heroes, and it has been named the uh, Irena Sendler Alley. So now we have, and the third, which uh, we'll see whether it ever gets built, is a proposal to create a monument to the righteous right in front of the largest glass window in Poland, which is the window on the other side of the museum. When you come into the museum, you would walk to that big window and you would look out and you would see a monument to the righteous. So far it's not happening and I don't know what it will, but it's a kind of cordon sanitaire. It's a kind of a ringing of the museum with, um, well, with this historical policy, I would say. 
Now, I, of course, am particularly interested in how all of this plays out in museums. And of course, I am particularly interested in how all of this affects the museum for which I'm responsible, which is Pauline Museum. And um, so basically, um, the Minister of Culture, uh, Minister uh, of Culture Glinsky, he had a press conference and he announced, or had several press conferences, and he announced that in the um, pre-war Jewish hospital building where Yanis Korchak worked, and which was for a time inside the ghetto and then outside, and which has been lying derelict, it's a great big building, and it's right near the last remnant of the wall of the Warsaw Ghetto, that he's going to make a museum of the Warsaw Ghetto. And he explained what the key message of that museum would be, and that it would be the story of the love of two nations. I am quoting, a story of the love of two nations. So we'll see what it will be, because we haven't seen a program for it, we haven't seen a scenario, we haven't seen a concept statement, but that already, and, and, uh, he's also said he would create a museum of Hasidism. That um, that's another as to whether that'll ever happen is another story. And twenty other museums, including one dedicated to the cursed soldiers. That's another whole story. But the net result is that he's getting a lot of pushback. And in particular, there is one uh, member of parliament, Robert Vinitsky, who issued. 15 questions to the, to the minister, and in many ways captured a lot of the objections to the minister allocating so much money to Jewish projects. Uh, but I should say there's one project that the minister is allocating money to that I think is wonderful, and that is to the renovation of the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw, which is an incredible cemetery. And there's a very large sum over a period of time to the renovation of the cemetery. So that's another story. Now, love about, um, uh, now, I don't agree with, with uh, Vinitsky, but smart, sharp, to the point, and among the many, many questions was this, and that is, the new museum of the Warsaw Ghetto, what kind of a museum will it be? Will it be a traditional museum that presents a neutral history, or will it be a modern museum, like Pauline Museum, which treats history as a starting point for debate. Mm -hmm. So already you can see that there is a very different concept of what a museum is. And among his other questions is, will it be a private-public partnership like Pauline Museum, or will it be 100% under the control of the Minister of Culture, who will decide on its director, who will decide on its museum council, on its advisory board, on its content, on its historical narrative, what kind of museum will it be? Now, to really properly understand the difference, let's look at two cases. Let's look at what the Smithsonian said in a really interesting recent article. How do we democracies, museums can When you see what trust means, it means confronting different points of view. It means open discussion and debate. It means asking uncomfortable questions, facing difficult histories. And if we looked at the Lynn uh, and a very interesting statement by Neil McGregor, the former uh, director of the British Museum, he says, there isn't one history, there isn't one story, there isn't one master narrative. This is, these are, this is a completely different paradigm. This is a completely different model of what a museum is. And of course, Pauline Museum is much more in keeping with this model than with the model that the, the, current, uh, the current government in its historical policy has in mind. So let me just say a word about Pauline Museum and what it's facing in the current climate. So Pauline Museum is an idea started in 1993, but it wasn't actually founded until 2005. And when it was founded, the founders included the mayor of Warsaw and uh, Lev Kaczynski, who, who perished in the crash of the plane that was on its way to Smolensk. So, and he uh, obviously is from the Law and Justice Party, and by a Jewish NGO, the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland. And every mayor of Warsaw and every president of Poland supported the creation of this museum, no matter what the political party. And that is, that is absolutely exceptional. And so the museum itself, Pauline Museum, was actually established on the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto, on the rubble of the pre-war Jewish neighborhood, 
The area looked like this after the Germans suppressed the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and destroyed the area. And the intention was always that the museum would be located facing the monument of the ghetto heroes and that it would complete the memorial complex. That we would go to the monument to honor those who died by remembering how they died, and we would go to the museum to honor them by remembering how they lived for a thousand years. And so the, the, from 1993 until 2000, actually 18, we've had more than two and a half million visits. And we've won every major award and prize uh, in uh, the European Museum of the Year Award, European Museum Academy Prize, Best in Heritage, um, and really is astonishing. So what kind of, I mean, what, so what is it about Pauline Museum that the authorities find so problematic? One is that they don't have total control over it. That's the first problem. Why? Because there are three partners. And because the Ministry of Culture is only one partner, the city of Warsaw is a partner, and the association. Therefore, the minister doesn't have complete control over it, and that is something he's criticized for. Second of all, our approach is a spectrum of relations. That is a story of coexistence and conflict, cooperation and competition, separation and integration. And this is critical. That is, we want to be authoritative, but not authoritarian. There is a big, big difference. And what that means is that we create an open narrative, a multi-voiced narrative, a narrative that raises questions, encourages critical reflection. And that is not the model uh, that the uh, model of the museum that we have, for example, expressed by Nitsky, who is actually expressing a wider perspective. And lastly, that we want to create a trusted zone for engaging difficult subjects. And the the idea that that's also not part that is. I would say that the so-called traditional museum that they're interested in is a museum that will consolidate a national identity and not open up and raise these difficult questions. So in our case, we have multiple voices in the original languages. We have Hebrew, uh, uh, Polish, Latin, Yiddish, you name the languages and quotations from, uh, 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 I would say, writers or politicians or individuals who are for or who are against and we put them all together and ask our visitors in a sense to confront this chorus of, of debate that's inside the actual historical sources and we we present a kind of symbiosis of polish and ukrainian and jewish and belarusian and lithuanian cultures and we position the holocaust within a thousand year history of polish jews in a way that doesn't lead teleologically to the Holocaust as the logical endpoint of a thousand year history of anti-Semitism. And that is critical, I think, to the way in which we work, which means that, of course, during the interwar years, and especially after the death of Piłsudski in 1935, uh, anti-Semitism in Poland was at its worst. It was a very, um, if you will, Piłsudski had operated in the interwar years with Poland as a state of nations where a nation state it's not a state of nations and nation state is very associated in the late 30s with um i would say extreme uh, right-wing nationalism and with extreme anti-semitism and anti-semitic violence and so the holocaust gallery touches on very difficult issues and uh, obviously focuses on the Warsaw Ghetto because we're a site-specific museum with using the materials from the Ringelblum archive. And the post-war period, we deal frontally with post-war violence with the pogrom in Kielce in 1946. And on the right, you can see other towns, other places where there were other forms of violence between basically around 40, I would say 45 to 48, uh, with an opportunity for visitors to explore the documents and all the kinds of materials. But the, in my, from my point of view, um, to say it's the most tragic is maybe an exaggeration, but one of the most poignant moments in the history of post-war, uh, if you will, anti-Semitism are the events of March 68, which we present. And it's, it, it's now in this year that we have devoted the year to the anniversary of March 68. And what that means is that we've developed a temporary exhibition, public programs, lectures, panels, conference, publications, and we uh, decided to call this project Opse Domu, meaning I call it estranged. 
um, uh, March 68 and its aftermath, but literally translated, it would be aliens or strangers at home. And the Ministry of Culture refused to fund it. So what happened was that we applied to them. We get operating support from the ministry in the city, but we applied to them for projects, and we applied to them for this. And we got back the question, why are you calling it strangers at home, aliens at home, opposite? Why are you calling it that? Poles and Jews get along. It, 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 we don't like the title. So uh, Darius said, okay, we'll call it March 68 and its aftermath. But they also objected and wanted to know who was on the organizing committee for the conference, for example, wanting to be sure that their historical policy would somehow be uh, recognized and be uh, followed. And in fact, there was even an effort to introduce legislation that would determine how the story of March 68 is to be told, that it should be told as a positive story of youth opposing the communist regime. And uh -huh. that this aspect, the anti-Semitic aspect, was, uh, was, if you will, was recognized, and actually recognized in ways that I found quite surprising. So, the, so March 68, the painfulness of those who had to leave and had to, could take a $5 American dollar bill with them, had to make a long list of every little thing they were taking, pencils, pens, you know, underwear, whatever. The humiliation of renouncing their Polish citizenship was extraordinarily painful, and we've created a really, I think, powerful and beautiful exhibition inspired by the train station where there were all of these farewells. And so uh, there were reviews, and uh, some of the reviews were very, very positive, but there was also pushback. And what was most, most controversial? At the very, very end of the exhibition is a section that uh, uh, shows a, a dissimilarity between anti-Semitic statements today in social media, on the part of TV presenters, politicians, uh, even the church, and statements that were made in March 68. But those statements are never identified as to who said them. You've got the statement, but it doesn't say so-and-so, because it's the statement that's anti-Semitic, not the person. It, it could be that the person is actually very sympathetic and doesn't even realize that the statement is anti-Semitic. So it's not an accusation to a person, but it is identifying. Well, this um, uh, Mrs. Ogurek, um saw her tweet on the wall. And she was a, uh, she was a former uh, presidential candidate, and now she's a television news presenter, and she was furious. And she said, oh, that's my tweet. She said, I demand that it be removed, and I demand a... Uh, an apology from the director, and I'm going to sue him. So the director said, I'm not going to give you an apology, I'm not going to remove the, the statement, but I'm going to invite you to take you to the exhibition and to explain to you, you know, why we are doing it, what the problem is with this. Now, what was it that she said that was so uh, egregious? And that is, she asked a senator, Senator Marek Borowski, why he changed his surname from Berman to Borowski. Now, this was very typical of March 68. Number one, he apparently didn't change his surname, but it, apparently his father did. It's, it's, in fact, I think his father's name was Aaron Berman, there, uh, at least in the, um, in the Polish uh, Biographical Dictionary. Uh, it identifies him as such. But what this does is essentially discredits an individual by suggesting that they're hiding their Jewish origins. And in this case, it's also identified with communism. So it's this what they call Jeune Communa, the idea that communism somehow rather is a Jewish project. So she was really offended because she didn't understand or see this as an anti-Semitic statement. And she even said, I've come to the museum many times. I've brought my 12-year-old daughter. I don't understand why you would uh, you know, quote me in this way. So clearly, um, uh, but that was the most controversial. But this, I think, is really extraordinary. And that is that um, on the 50th anniversary of March 68, uh, President Duda at the University of Warsaw gave a speech. And I want you to have, uh, I was really stunned by this speech. It's a mixed bag, but I still, I must say, I take it as a very, very important statement. So he starts, first of all, with the master narrative, that it's young people fighting against communism and censorship, etc. But then he shifts, and he says, there's another aspect of those days to it, the bitter one 
the unspeakably sad one, the one to be grieved over today and in the future. There are people who say that today's Poland should apologize for the act of anti-Semitism back then, committed by the, the authorities then in power. Also for the complicity of those Poles who joined in. For having expelled, for expulsion, it must be called several, uh, uh, in other words, there were several thousand people who were, uh, if you will, who were expelled. And so then he says, ladies and gentlemen, the free Poland of today and my generation do not uh, have to bear responsibility and they don't have to apologize so, as much as they don't have to apologize for many other things. But that being said, so in other words, it's like a non-apology, but then it's an apology. <laughs> that being said, and, and, and you can imagine that this will play, not play very well to this pedagogy of shame issue. Um, although the way that this is formulated, which is to blame the communist authorities, but nonetheless, he's better than that. This being said, I want to stress that it is with profound grief that we bow our heads, that I as president bow my head before those who were then expelled. Please forgive, please forgive the Republic of Poland. Please forgive the Poles. Please forgive Poland at the time for having perpetrated such a shameful act. And, and then he goes on, Pol he says, Poland, with my lips, is asking forgiveness of the people back then. May they, uh, um, may they forget, may they accept that Poland is grieved not to have them on her soil right now, and then he complained of all the wonderful talent that left Poland and that accomplished so much in the countries they went to. That's extraordinary, in my opinion. That is extraordinary. And that gives me cause for optimism. And my, 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 um, my, my parting remark on optimism. So first of all, this uh, Dariusz uh, Wojciński is a leader of dialogue in Zabsha and is part of a forum for dialogue with uh, which uh, the uh, American Jewish Committee works with very, very closely. And th th these are people who just continue to do the good work that they do, not to lose 30 years of building positive Polish-Jewish relations. Similarly, hundreds of Poles gathered to express solidarity with Jews. And this means non-Jews that are gathering and protesting on the streets. Thirdly, the or many, many of the, um, I would say, Polish uh, academic associations wrote a letter of protest. And the uh, rector of Warsaw University defended Michał Bilewicz, who was being pilloried in the, in the right-wing press for having delivered a speech at Polish Museum that would reported on his attitudes of Poles towards Jews and the upsurge of it. And so I would, I would really Gosha said in her remarks, opportunity here that we have spent 30 years on building these positive relationships and that we mustn't give up on Poland. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Baba. Don't go anywhere. We're going to have a Q and A <laughs> um, for for a very deep dive into Poland of today and, and setting the context. Um, now we will entertain a, a few questions uh, for Barbara. Do you have any questions? Uh, has anyone been prosecuted under the law? And so, what did they say? There's one effort that will go nowhere. And what happened was, I think, in Argentina. There was an article in the press about Yevapna, and some person who's responsible for the photographs used a photograph of the accursed soldiers for that. And that you know, created a huge brouhaha, and there was an attempt to bring a lawsuit against it. But you can't prosecute outside the country, for starters. And that's just, um, how can I say, it's a very extreme reaction. Just tell the newspapers the wrong photograph and tell them to change it. Yeah, as simple as that. So it's not going anywhere. There has been, for a couple of years now, an attempt to prosecute Jan Gross. In fact, this Holocaust bill is often called the Jan Gross bill, the Gross bill. So, and that's not going anywhere either. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see. But so far, no, no. I'm not sure that everyone knows who Jan Gross is. Ron, Jan Gross was the professor who wrote the book Neighbors, which was about the pogrom after the war in Yabavna. So was, I'm not sure everyone knows. Yes, sir. I'm a Holocaust survivor from Poland. 
I don't know what it, but I've been through the Holocaust, and I have witnessed all this history we're talking about. The fact is that as I was growing up, as a little kid, anti-Semitism was so prevalent in Poland for so many years that if I would just say a single word that would offend a, a, a playmate, I would become immediately a scabby Jew, a shibizhidzie. This was under the surface. It was always there. The museum is a wonderful thing, but it is a thorn in the side of all Poles. It portrays and it, it makes it clear what their culpability. They don't want to acknowledge it. That is the whole thing all about. It was the controversy. And if anybody thinks that bending over backwards, that creating a dialogue with the Poles is going to ameliorate this situation of a time they are fantasizing. The Poles have their anti-Semitism imbibed with their mother's milk. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry for your suffering, and I, I read, you know, there's the survivors have an authority that can never be questioned. Um, but let me say one thing. One of Barbara's uh, slides that she talked about it was, be, you know, there was only a, a Republic of Poland the second time around from 1919 to 1939. And she said after Marshal Pilsudski died, there was no longer a protector of the Jews. After that... I didn't, every, I didn't exactly say that, but that's no, okay. Okay. <laughs> You know that that it got a lot worse after it got the, worse. Uh, the marshal died, and most of the parties. I was just reading a report about this before this. Uh, most of the parties uh, had a had a anti-Semitic mandate, um, and there was a wasn't there a government or national unity or a uh, that that was a conglomeration of, of anti-Semitic anti-Semitic parties before 1939. And more questions? No. Um, my parents were from Poland, concentration camp survivors, the only ones of their families. And they had more disdain for the Poles after the war than the Germans. And a lot of that was because those Jews who survived, who went back to Poland to reclaim property they owned, were basically at gunpoint told, it's not yours anymore, go away. And Poland has never provided any restitution. Germany has, Sweden has, I don't know why they did, but my parents got something from them. And I know there's a bill before the Polish parliament right now that ha is going under review again because there's been a lot of backlash against it that would basically prevent uh, Jews by its wording from ever seeking restitution for property rights. Yeah, it's a, much, it's a very complicated story because there was also the seizing the property or the, um, what do you call it, like under the communists, for example, there are there are all those Poles and Jews that were living in the area that was then, uh, uh, that was given from Poland to Belarus, to Belarus, Lithuania, Ukraine. They were displaced, they ended up in the territory that was taken from Germany. So there's a lot of displacement. My father's town of Opatov, there, there, there were 10,000 people there before the war, 6,500 Jews. And today there's about 7,000 people, of course, no Jews. And only 10 families in that town are actually from that town. In other words, the dislocation, the dislocation and the loss of property is, is not just a Jewish issue. It's a much, much broader issue. It's a very complicated <coughs> issue. And I'm not really an expert to be able to reflect on the current status of the law. But I, I do know that it's um, it's not just a Jewish issue. It's a it's a terrible Jewish issue, but it's not just a Jewish issue. Yeah, you so I, just a the council general one oh. comment on that subject. That law was sent back for review. It didn't say anything about Jews. Uh, the project that was deliberated uh, specifically said that only Polish uh, citizens would apply for some sort of restitutions, and it was sent back for reconsideration for redrawing just because of that because it would be unjust to give uh, back property only to citizens because many people who lived in poland left poland for various reasons jews and not jews alike and uh, you were not right that 
some uh, sums were not given away. Uh, funny enough, communist government concluded several uh, treaties with several countries called indemnization treaties that actually paid some lump sum of money to that government and that government disbursed that money. States. Thank you, A lot of time spent, you know, I have documents which was taken away by the and I mean, it was never, I think some of it is Between thirty-five and forty billion dollars that would never be returned. So I think there is some questions of economy, and nobody wants to give a fat us. You know. Yes, sir. So I was, I'm wondering, in terms of Polish national narratives, whether this fits into the long-standing self-understanding of Poland as Christ of nations. Absolutely. And 100%. whether this is, in some sense, nothing new. There's a big deal being made about Poland as a Christ of nations. This is a consistent line. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a kind of romantic um, approach to Polish history, as Polish that, that is to say that um, Poland as the Christ of nations. Yeah, from Mickiewicz, a, a Polish romantic poet from the 19th century, and particularly you have to remember he's writing when, when there is no Poland. He's right, well, there's, there's a section of the Russian partition that is technically the Kingdom of Poland, but basically, basically, Poland lost its sovereignty between, in, in steps, between 1772 and World War I. And so he's really writing um, about um, the, in, in a sense, the preservation of a sense of Pol a Polish nation under those conditions. And then it fo is followed by occupation by Germany, and then it's by, by the Soviets, and so the sense of, uh, I would say, uh, that, that, I mean, it's martyrological, yeah. it's heroic, it's romantic, and those that's very, very typical, and it speaks in a very emotional and very resonant way, particularly to an older generation, to an, an, um, and, I, and I think especially in the areas where uh, this party has a great strength, which is the rural areas, the eastern part of Poland, so yes, I think that's very accurate. I would also say it's a very clever thing in the sense that if you're a victim, you don't owe to anybody. You're, you're the one that is, has been uh, injured. And so therefore, I mean, different than what Germany did and other countries did, if you are the victim, uh, you don't have an obligation to restitute anyone. Uh, you're the one that is injured. Yeah, but so, Austria played that card in a different way. I think this is you. Austria this plays that unique. card. You know, Hungary plays that card because they lost three quarters of their territory after World War One. So I mean, it's, it, that's called the Trianon card. So cut, countries, uh, it, and therefore Hungary has not restituted any property to the Jews because they use that same victimhood. So there's two ways of looking at that. Yes, ma'am. I would like to uh, clarify. Uh, um, as a child who grew up in Israel and a child of survivors, um, it always puzzled me, and I think that we share that question. How is it as hard as it is for someone like me to forgive? Germany, Nazis. How is it that I'm so hurt and so angry at the countries that I was born in, in Poland, and my family is there? And yes, not all, not all of you did it. I mean, how can you compare? Why is the anger there is so much? And I'll tell you what I, why the discussion here. It occurs to me. Um, there's no way to forgive the Nazis. But the acceptance of guilt, 
uh, the younger generation that works with Holocaust survivors, whatever, it's like oxygen. We're so hungry for it. We want to believe it. We buy into it. On the other hand, the pain, the anger of hearing, no, it didn't happen. No, it wasn't like this. No, you are the ones who are accusing us of. It hurts even more. Can you imagine? It hurts more than the pain of Nazis. Thank you for sharing that with all of us. Um, I, I, I uh, let, me, let me just say one thing. Um, I, I, I feel your, your horrible pain. I'm the son of two Hungarian Holocaust survivors. Uh, I have a very love-hate relationship with Hungary. Uh, I'll tell you one of the this pain that he felt in the forced labor camps it was his country betraying him. And he was not a Jewish Hungarian, he was a Hungarian Jew. His were World War I meddled bravery. Um, no, I is your truth. Can I have a yes? Uh, I would like to, to ask you, I would like to ask you about the Armia Krajowa. After the war, we came to Lodge. I was born in Lodge. And the Armia Krajowa every day went into the houses of the Jews and killed them. Why did the government not take any, any, how do you say, yeah. action? Yeah. My English is not very yeah, well. Yeah, English is yeah. fine. Yeah. Why would, why would they nothing do about it? At school, I was in a Polish school, a lodge, and they said to me, you killed our children. And you make matches from the blood of the children. Yeah. Why would it be? I don't have an answer. It, it, you don't actually, have an answer? Well, yeah, uh, Gosha. <clears throat> I don't know if I have an answer, but what I can offer is um, <clears throat> in Germany, just like you said, um, it was very clear cut and very obvious. And also, Germany has had since 1945 to grapple with what they did. Um, and in early years after the war, nobody wanted to talk about it. They were ashamed, they were terrified, they wanted to move on, they wanted to rebuild. But they had since 1945 to go through a certain psychological process to the whole society need to really, and a certain generation had to get older and their kids had to get older to start asking questions and really delving deeply into this. Poland has only been doing it for 29 years. Under communism, the communist government decided what was taught in schools, how it was taught, how it was discussed, how it was not discussed. And so so if so I understand your 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 frustration with this, but these things take time. It would with proper historical research, with proper institutions to come up to help educate society, and for the society to become mature enough to really know how to deal with these questions. So I hope that, that Poland will get there and will deal with these very difficult questions. And I think the museum is the place that begins this conversation so deeply, um, but we just haven't gotten to that yet. Okay, if I can also respond, and that is that the immediate post-war years was um, actually a chaotic situation. That is, the country wasn't fully demilitarized. People were walking around with weapons, with guns. Uh, there was banditry, rape, pillage, uh, homelessness. It was a very unstable situation. The, it took time 
to actually get control over the country and bring kind of do a law and order. It was lawless in the immediate, immediate post war years. It's not a way of it's not a, it's not a way of in any way excusing or, or, or shifting responsibility, but it, it it helps it helps a little bit to understand um, what you what you experienced, and we show that we actually show it in the museum, and the fact that we can show it and that the Minister of Culture's objections is not so much to the museum as it is to our outspoken director. And that's, I think, uh, that, that, that's something, uh, and, and he, whoops. No, it's just, the, it's just this going on. Oh, mm -hmm. um, no, 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 this is ours. But in any event, if, uh, if the objections are to, uh, to speaking out, and I think that um, what Gosher described, yeah. described under communism, which is that there was a kind of, uh, if you will, a setting down of what could be said or couldn't be said, unfortunately, that's what we're seeing again. And that is where the, the, the pushback is coming. And that's also where some of the very negative, uh, I would say, uh, responses to current developments in Poland is coming from as well. Could we read that? Yes, ma'am. Back there. Uh, what are your current sort of curatorial projects deal with this? historical um, context that you've described to us. Sure. Well, first of all, March 68. I mean, that's, well, actually, let, let me sort of describe a set of them. Previous to March 68, and this relates to, to your comment, we did an exhibition called Blood, Uniting and Dividing. And we looked at blood libel. We looked at, uh, as well as all kinds of other aspects of Polish-Jewish relations through the lens of blood. And whether it's DNA or it's uh, blood and nationalism or it's blood and Judaism, blood and Christianity. So, and that was a kind of um, historical attempt, an attempt to sort of put uh, a set of relations in historical perspective through a very particular lens. March 68 now is this one. But interestingly, how do we commemorate 2018 as the regaining of the Second Polish Republic, regaining of Polish independence? Because that's a political issue. So instead of doing what you would expect from the Museum of Polish History or from some other history museum, we actually created an exhibition for children inspired by a, one of the most popular children's books in Poland by Janusz Korczak, um, a, a Jewish uh, a doctor and a wonderful educator, pedagogue, incredible person. And what is this book about? It's about a, a boy that wants to be king. And he makes himself king, and he tries to set up a government. And so it's a kind of civics lesson as to what it means to set up a government, what it means to be a citizen. And of course, he fails. Uh, and then there's a sequel. There's another book. But the, what we've done is to create um, a, an exhibition that is very much about citizen education, and it appeals to very young children and their families. And it's inspired by this children's book. And, it, and the book was written, and what it reflects, the regaining of Polish independence in, in, uh, in uh, 1918. So that, that would be an example. Um, we have, I'm trying to think of, well, there are some exhibitions that I would like to see us do. So, and, and we talked about it. And one would be on Jews and communism. Hot topic. You think that March 68 is controversial? Wait until we, and I, I mean, I don't think we're quite ready for it. But I would love for us to do something. And it was just an exhibition of Jews and Communism in the Jewish Museum of Vienna. But their situation and our situation is of a completely different order. And I tell you, that is one hot, that is one hot potato. And I think that we would be ready to do it under the right circumstances. The second one that I would love to see us do, because I just visited the Museum of the Cold War here in Los Angeles. It's marvelous. If you haven't been, go. It's a wonderful, wonderful museum. Uh, the, museum, the Museum of the Cold War in Culver City. It's terrific. It's, it just opened. It's terrific. You know, don't walk, run. It's really great. So we, uh, I would like to see us do something on the Cold War. Uh, you know, but, uh, uh, let me get to the question. I was in Poland this summer as a guest of the government. I would venture to say under, under this current government, the Pauline Museum would never get built. Um, there is a uh, in my opinion, a policy of victimhood and a policy that there's an obsession about uh, Poland being blamed for the Nazi period, you know, with the, the, the Polish concentration camp epithet, 
which I've never heard any educated scholar ever use, and I told the, uh, uh, someone with the foreign minister that. So it's, you know, these are not, uh, these are controversial issues. I think the bottom line from, from our museum and what you see downstairs, at some point, Poland has got to face its own history. And when you are passing laws telling people how to speak about your country, that's not basic history. I just want to make a comment. I'm a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. And I, I'm a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. And I've traveled to Poland a number of times. I helped establish an institute, teaching institute in Poland. Now, what's happened in Poland that you know, we people have studied where does the anti-Semitism arise and why. And if you really look at our country nowadays, every human being just hates anybody who is different from us. We always look for someone who is different, who we can hate, who we are better than they are. And that's what's happening now here in our country, in the United States. And I think that's very important to remember. And Jews have always been a large number of Jews in Poland. They're the minority. We were dark, we were different, we studied different things. So everybody wanted to find themselves better than these horrible people. And I think that's the basis of it. One little story. The I had a professor at UCLA who was the head of the political science department who was Polish. The way he explained it to us is he said, I learned how to read and write from the parish priest. But I also learned from that parish priest that the Jews killed our Lord. Yes. So, you know, you've got to, it, 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 it's endemic from the person who tells you to read, teaches you to read and write is the only educated person in your village that these are the, are the Christ killers. Okay, if I, can, if, I, if I can intervene here just for a moment because um, I, I just want to suggest a kind of broader historical perspective, and that is that uh, this is the place that became home to the largest Jewish community in the world. In the 18th century, according to the 1765 census, half the Jews, half the Jewish population of the world lived in the territory of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. That's 750,000 Jews. And they uh, basically were never expelled and they lived there continuously for a millennium. And so the, 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 this history is not possible if this is one unmitigated history of anti-Semitism. And I think what's happening is that we are looking back at this history through the lens of the Holocaust. And that is something that we try very hard not to do. And in fact, I believe that Colleen Museum in its current form the only thing that would stop it from being, not from being established, I do think it could be established under the current government because it was established under this party um, in 2005. The, the country was under the same party in 2005. The twin brother of the, of, the, of the head of the party signed the agreement. But what's the difference? The agreement that was signed was to give full control to the state. And today, the only way that a museum would if the state had full control over it, and that's what you're seeing is about, and that's where all the push his constituents are saying to him, why don't you fire that director? Why don't, do you know what's in that March 16th? In other words, there's an expectation that's the difference. But I mean, these are twin brothers, identical twins. <laughs> Just for the record. Dana, you had a question? Yes. I lived in a small village as a non-Jew for a while, and I heard everybody's words were, Jews killed God. Now imagine how guilty you would feel if you knew that from before, and then you were nice to a Jew. You were being you're not on on God's side. Okay, so let, let me, can I have this again? Yes. Okay. So I'll give you um, a, a So uh, my father was born a ring, my, my father was born a uh, up in the 
if you know Poland, you know it's not far from Kielce, Ostrowie, and Sandomierz. It's an, a, an area called Święty Krzysztof. And um, he, he left when he was 17. And in 1967, until he died about nine, nine years ago, over, I would say I'm I like to say, because I'm trained as an anthropologist, as a folklorist, I like to say that I got the right father, he got the right daughter. That's my, that's my approach. All of those, I have 10 hours of interviews, I recorded them all. He had a great child. I'll give you two, two examples. Where the Polish, the, the Christian boys would yell at the Jewish kids, Bayless. Uh, um, yes, yeah. Bayless. Yell at the Polish kids about. So, they, you know, they, 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 they uh, it's like, you know, the epithets that people use today, where one group says one thing, the other group says something else. He basically, he went to a cheder, to a Jewish after school. Um, he mainly hung out with Jewish kids, but 65% of the time was Jewish anyway. He had some non-Jewish friends, but they wouldn't be like his close, close friends. But there was a critical moment when he was getting ready to leave. He went to the town hall because he had to get certain papers. And one of his Christian friends from school was sitting on the other, uh, uh, sitting at the desk and said to him in Polish, and my father was very proud of his Polish. He was Jewish. And the, and the, uh, um, Meyer, Meyer, why are you leaving our fatherland? And my father said, because you're sitting on that side of the desk and I'm standing on this side of the desk. In other words, he's not simply a matter of education. Mainly the immigration is for economic reasons. Before the, I, I would say that when he, he left in 34, I mean, in leading up to it, the main motivator for leaving was economic. Sure, there was some, there was anti-Semitism for sure. But it history is and one mini un story of anti-Semitism is really a misreading of history and a reading of it through the lens of the immediate post-war years, through the lens of the communist period. Unfortunately. Uh, so what what I'm here, I'm also an anthropologist, and is that um, being the narrative open. And it sounds to totally. me like Poles would like to conclude the narrative. Not Poles, specifically specific yeah. groups. And groups that have a particular uh, approach to authority and to this history, yes. et cetera. Yes. Thank you. Because also one of the things that I'm concerned about is that, in fact, we're kind of getting into the dualism of Jews and Poles. And speaking and, in general about Poles as a collective, yes. every single and that is the beginning of the end. That's right. correct. We, we don't like it when people speak about Jews that way. Right. So I have a question for you, Barbara, which is if you go to the Museum um, of Native Americans on the, on the Mall in Washington, so that museum you can see is um, full of the present and the future. Um, and Jews have a stake in uh, recognizing the past, the thousand years of coexistence uh, what is, because it affects our future, what is the stake for those who are in the okay. law and justice? Okay. okay, well, let's, first of all, I want to say what is, it, what is in it for Jews living in Poland, and then what is it in our law and justice? So um, I, I like to think of the museum as supporting the renewal of Jewish life in Poland. How? Not, it's not a JCC. It's not a synagogue. That's not how it does it. We have, at the very end of the exhibition, an area post-89. And we interviewed 20-some-odd people, and we asked them a set of questions. And some of the questions are obvious. What does Israel mean to you? Is there a future for Jews in Poland? Is there anti-Semitism in Poland? Who can make Jewish culture? But we asked a question I would never think to ask here. And the question was, did you always know you were Jewish? I would never, I, in my life, such a question would never occur to me. So everybody asks, how many Jews are in Poland? And I like Rabbi Shudrick, the chief rabbi of Poland. I like his answer. His answer is, I don't know how many there are. All I know is that 
the Jewish population is increasing, but the birth rate is not going up. <laughs> so, what does that mean? What does it mean? It means, so the question is this. So, if that's the case, why do all these people not know? Why did they not find out? And some of them, not until a father was on a deathbed, until they were in their 50s or their 60s, and others when they were much younger. And of course, there were many who, who did know from the very beginning, but say it didn't matter until after March 68, when it started to really matter. So, the, so why? If you ask the parents, they said, we wanted to protect our children. That we hid them, we, we thought it would be better if they didn't know, as it turns out everybody else knew, but any event. It would be better, it would be better if they didn't know, and they did it out of fear and out of shame. And what this museum does is it's a glass building. Who builds a glass building on a site of genocide? Transparent, open, full of light and reflection. And the, what the museum says is, there's nothing to be afraid of, and there's nothing to be ashamed of, and there's much to be proud of, and here is a deep, thousand-year resource for building a, a richly Jewish future in Poland, and for that matter, in the world. And, uh, and so I see this uh, museum supporting the, uh, the renewal of Jewish life in Poland, but also elsewhere, because so much of Jewish identity uh, today in uh, Israel, as well as the diaspora, is predicated on Judaism, Israel, and Holocaust. And what's lost is this much wider, 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 and longer Jewish perspective. So, uh, and you can answer the question, what's in it for peace? What's in it for peace is to solve the problem of anti-Polishness. Anti-Polishness, anti-Polishness. Anti anti it, it means that there is a, a concern that there is a negative attitude towards Poland, and that that negative attitude is strongly associated with the accusation that Poland and Poles, all of them, all the time, are anti-Semitic. And so the, uh, the, this, this museum certainly doesn't communicate that message. It communicates violence, it communicates conflict, it communicates pogroms, it communicates all those things. But it doesn't communicate that forever and ever, all Poles were, are, and always will be anti-Semitic. And that is, a, 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 I would say, it's the primary source internationally of anti-Polishness. And to counter that, and this museum, I believe, does. Actually, it's one of the best ways of doing it. Thank you. Um, you know, it's one thing what the museum is trying to do. But I wanted to share a personal experience. Two years ago, we, we took a family history trip for my granddaughter's bat mitzvah. And she was bat mitzvahed in a synagogue in Warsaw. I would hardly call it a synagogue. And the pain of the congregants was so evident about how difficult their daily life is as Jews. In the hotel where we stayed, the people were very nice to us until they found out that we were part of a group for a bat mitzvah and that we were all Jews. So the Poland Museum is fantastic. It was an extraordinary experience to be there and I have great respect for what you're doing. What do you do about the people who have been in ingrained with this for so long? Um, and how do you move forward? They don't come to the museum. Actually, you're right. You know something? And you, okay. Yeah, no, you absolutely no. You're right. So, like this, our two, 2.5 mil, first of all, I gotta tell you that we're having a mitzvah in the museum. I recommend, uh, we're having a mitzvah in the museum, and it will be a very joyous occasion. I don't think you're gonna, you would experience sort of pain and etc. It's gonna be very special and under our gloss jets painted ceiling and, you know, whatever. Uh, but what I would say is that we've had 2.5 million visits. It's fewer visitors because some of them come multiple times. Population of Greater Warsaw is about 2 million people. Population of Poland is something like about 39 million people, more or less. There's a, there's a lot of, there are, there are a lot of uh, people for us to reach. One of the things that we do is to send, one of the things that we do is to send, we have a museum on wheels, that we send around the country to towns that have populations of less than 50,000. 
And in some of these places, they're so tiny that we are the only event of the whole year, and they have to compete for us to come, and the mayor, and the high schools, and the whatever. So what I would say is that our mission is not to fix what's wrong with Poland. That's not our mission, and, and nor could we. What we can do is, in a sense, model what, um, I would say, an open, um, and open and critical reflection on history can look like, and, and what a reasonable dialogue can look like, because that for us is the way forward. And it's not a matter of, I would say this, we create a zone of trust. What does that mean? It means that we have to trust our visitors. We can't start out with a presumption that our visitors are coming to us and that they're a bunch of anti-Semites and that we're going to fix them. We can't, that is not, we took a decision that our museum and our exhibition and our history was not going to be defensive. And it was not going to start with an agenda of what's wrong with Poland and then construct a historical narrative and an exhibition to fix it. But rather, what we would as respectable and respected academics, historians, literary historians, anthropologists, etc., really present the history in a way that was authoritative without being authoritarian. And that we would model a way of reflecting, thinking, and disgusting. This disgusting. Oh my god. <laughs> that, was that too. And that too. Barbara, we have another Okay, so and then even just, just to conclude, so that we would create a zone of trust where we trust them and they trust us. Because if we're not a trusted institution, we can no. back here. No. Thank you what your museum uh, and, and me your history the thousand year history they were there just because it was the least worst place and, and what what your there seems to be some naivety here I, I this elderly gentleman to my right what he's what he spoke about what he feels is real and what you teach in the museum or what the someone in the faculty teaches at schools cannot overcome what is taught in the home for a millennium. Okay. And, and I, I don't mean to be critical, but can you counter that? Okay, uh, uh, Gosha's gonna try. We'll give, we'll, let's give uh, her a chance. Thank you. I, so I hear your experience, I've heard these experiences, that, that people had those experiences before. But I'd like to give you a, a different example. Um, a partner of ours formed for Dialogue, Warsaw-based NGO. They have a program called School of Dialogue. They have educators who go to schools in small towns all over Poland. They do over 300 projects a year of this sort. Those educators go, they take a week of the school children's curriculum to help them engage with the history of their town, including the history of Jews who lived in their town. They don't come to them and tell them, this is who Jews are, this is who they were, so they perish. No, they, help, they guide the children in doing their own research. Um, at the end of the day, of the, the projects, those kids become the advocates for the remembrance of the Jewish community of their town. They organize tours for their parents, their grandparents, the mayor, everybody around. And let's say you are a child survivors from Sandomierz. Um, and if you go to Sandomierz, your experience will be those children, those teenagers waiting eagerly to host you in their town to show you around, to tell you the stories that they've learned about the baker here and the shoemaker there, and, and your experience would be very, very different. So I wanted you to know that that's also part of the story and the reality of who Poles are right now. And if you travel to Poland, there are countless little towns all over where there are people who are friends from Form for Dialogue called leaders of dialogue, who take it upon themselves to commemorate the Holocaust, commemorate how Jews lived, how they died, um, and in smallest towns all over Poland, you'll see these really amazing people doing that. Well, I, I'll get you one sec. I, uh, there's a new group in Europe of the Central European countries. I mentioned I mentioned about the, the right-wing uh, parties, but there's a new, it's called the Visegrad Group. And it is four countries in Europe, including Poland and Hungary and Slovakia, um, that is a band of nationalist, xenophobic governments and parties. And you are not going to get progress on these societal issues when the government uh, or the leading party in the country 
are peddling a revised history where you're always the victim and you're fed in here, you're innocent. Um, you gotta face reality and face your guilt, whatever that may be, and then move on. That is not the movement in Central Europe. All these things that are, that are happening uh, are great in the museum. I was in the museum uh, this past summer. But I also had conversations in other museums. And I heard a history that I knew wasn't the Polish Jewish history. And it was about the Poles being victims. And even in Berkenau, the first thing that the guide was talking about were the Poles, the Poles, the Poles. Well, my grandparents died in Berkenau. And that is not the story of Berkenau. So I, I have a real problem. There's wonderful things going on here. But until people face the truth of history, and it may not be their truth, but they have to acknowledge the truth of all those who suffered. Many of them are in our room today, um, and and not whitewash it, and then you move on. And there's a question back. Here. Poland had their independence just celebrating a hundred years of independence. They had a one hundred years of the history of anti-Semitism. What makes anyone in his sane mind believe? that the next hundred years will be different. I'm sorry. Uh, there's another question over here. Uh, yes. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, first of all, I would like to thank Gosha, Gosha Weiss. Okay, we got to. We have to uh, thank you. You know, um, maybe we've been talking tonight about a Polish problem, but really, maybe it's the world problem, and we should think of it that way. You, you yeah. kind of alluded to that. Yeah, that's, that was Paul's point too. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just ask you. You there's clues. The whole point of the part of the beginning of the presentation, which is. I thought your attorney general, I mean, not yours, but the Polish attorney general declared these articles invalid or unconstitutional. Where do we stand with that? Is it still in a bit? You know? it's, it's still in process, so far yeah, as I know. It's the, the part that it applied to foreigners, that was taken out. Yeah, well, I mean, but, but it's, it hasn't been resolved. It's unresolved. It's unresolved. If I may, in 2006, it was a similar vote that was struck down by the Constitutional Tribunal. And it was because of the same reason, because it is bridging on the freedom of speech. So the hopes of the many people are that uh, history will repeat itself. <laughs> yes, uh, it is our hope. My yeah. question is in a very different vein. I'd like to ask you, Barbara, what challenges you faced living in Warsaw as an American and as a Jew? As a Canadian. A Canadian, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, sorry, uh, listen, I, I, I got you know, and, and, and a Polish passport. As, as Walter Ross's mother once said, a Jew can't have too many passports. <laughs> 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 can I add something? No, I just wanted to add something to this question. Why, would, why did you go back to Poland? Why did I go back to Poland? Yes. Okay, so it's a similar, okay, so first of all, okay, so let me just say this, that I went to Poland for the first time in 1981. 
And um, because at that point I had worked uh, at the Hebrew Institute for Jewish Research, had worked with a wonderful historian, Lucy Gobrzyczynski, to create an exhibition and a book and a film called Image Before My Eyes. Some of you may know it. And I've been interviewing my father. And I thought to myself, you know, I have got to go there. I know it's not going to be the Poland my father went from, came from. It's not going to be the Poland that image before my eyes, but I have got to go. I said to my father, you know, I'm going to go. Come with me. He said, never, he said. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, they can all go to hell. That's basically. So I said, I don't get it. You know, in all your stories of your childhood, running around the town with your hoop and everything, you've never, ever. But I also knew that his family, his, uh, his parents had lost all their siblings, their wives, their children, and that they, uh, that when, his, when his father got the news as to what had happened to his family, he began to shake and he never stopped shaking for the rest of his life. So the, and I remember a journalist in San Francisco once asked us, at, at the time of an exhibition of his, once asked us, how many of your family died in the Holocaust? So I, I never thought to ask my father. So I called him up and I said, and we started to count. We got to 48, we stopped counting. It just didn't see there was any point to continue counting. Seven years later, he says, I want to go. I don't know what happened, but he changed his mind. We went, and it was 15 minutes in his town was too much. It was not a successful visit. But about 10 years later, we went, and it's a long story, but it was a good visit. And we started to go over and over again. And he started to paint what he could remember when he was 73. And he painted for the last 20 years of his life. He's a self-taught painter, uh, like a folk artist. And he painted all the stories that he had actually told me and that were in the recorded interviews. And the town embraced him as the only person that could remember what none of them could remember. And they wanted to make him an honorary citizen. And he said, what do you mean honorary? I'm, at, I'm a citizen already. He said, but that's an extra. You know, it's extra to be an honorary citizen. So then what I found absolutely astonishing is that after an exhibition that we did do in his town, that uh, we got a message from the high school teacher. And she said, I'm making a competition for my art students that they should go around the town and they should photograph or draw the places that your father painted. So they did. And she said, we're going to announce the uh, winners of the competition in October, October 22nd. I didn't pay attention to the date. And then on October 23rd, we got another message. And she said that for the first time since the Holocaust, the town commemorated the deportation of all the Jews from Apatov to Treblinka and the 500 that were taken to forced labor in Sandomierz. And that the service was, they lit the white candles, they played Jewish music, high school students read from the testimony from the witnesses, the, 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 the local witnesses to the deportation, and they have since continued to do that. And that is what I call constructive engagement. It is, and, and the thing was that they, my father embraced them, they embraced him, and they came in their own way and in their own time to um, confronting this terrible event, and when we were there, they also talked about those who betrayed Jews. In other words, the local people were completely open. So it's it's a very special experience, and it has a lot to do, it's got to do with trust and openness. And if you are trustful and open towards others, you can achieve much more than through a more, how can I say, distrustful and aggressive approach. I don't, I, don't know, I don't even have words. On that positive note, we're going to have to bring it to a close. I hope you all realize that this museum uh, is a family, um, and our survivors are very sacred parts of our family. The survivors' children are very really sacred part of our family. Um, and we like to have, as, as all families, a very vibrant discussion of these very, very important issues. And, and how they relate to our world today. So I want to thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, quickly say thank you to our partners tonight um, who contributed to this event.
for UCLA, maybe something. Oh, Paul did. Okay, then I don't need to. And the Polish consulate, the Polish consulate was very generous. Um, and actually, the Polish consulate are the ones in the lion's den. If I may say so. Right. And so I thank you very, very, very much for supporting the event and for being here. It really is very, very important. Plus, this is the book we did with my father with the paintings and the stories and everything. And thank you. And for really marvelous. Thank you so much for bringing it. I really appreciate it. Thank you, the elevator committee. Thank you, the elevator committee.